Dr. Radek Sikorski, um, Poland and you personally have been amongst the very strongest supporters of Ukraine from the very beginning. Um, but in the last few months, we've started to see some tensions, the farmers, the truckers, for example, in Poland. So tell us a bit more about how you manage that process of keeping that extraordinary Polish support for Ukraine, which is, by the way, one of the very few things on which almost all parties in Polish politics can agree since, since 1989, while at the same time managing those concerns that coming from being a neighbor. I'll come to that, but I, I'd like you to uh, uh, know that I was also the first NATO defense minister to visit Georgia. <laughs> And uh, therefore, uh, as a friend of Georgia, I'd like uh, you, Madam President, to know that uh, we remember that this conference used to be attended by your predecessor, um, uh, President uh, Saakashvili, and that to many of us, he's a symbol of um, the modernization of Georgia. And um, uh, we respect your rule of law, but we also think that his treatment is, uh, is very important. Um, uh, it, it's very important that he be treated fairly and, uh, and perhaps uh, you could contribute to his release. It would be those who wish Georgia well would welcome it. Um, as regards Ukraine, you're quite right. Poland uh, received over a million uh, refugees without a refugee camp into our, into our homes. Um, and we support uh, strategically uh, Ukraine. Uh, there is a sort of competition about who does the most. Uh, our German allies say that they contribute the most. Uh, um, uh, in absolute numbers, um, the Baltic states claim that they uh, uh, support militarily per capita in the, in the greatest uh, amounts. Uh, we claim that if you add up the uh, uh, help to refugees, the military stuff and the financial stuff, we do the most uh, on per capita basis, um, which is a noble competition. But yes, we do have the, these two niggling problems to do with grain and to do with trucking. And the, the Deputy Prime Minister and I literally, just before walking in here, uh, discussed this. Um, and this is difficult because it's structural. Um, uh, w when we decided to uh, uh, make Ukraine a candidate and then we decided to open negotiations, um, you know, I thought that these will be the most difficult things to negotiate and that there would be uh, quotas and there would be transition periods. Instead of which, um, uh, out of sympathy with Ukraine and you know, under urgent pressure of events, um, and you know, the, the spirit was correct. We have induced those two areas, essentially admitted Ukraine into the single market without any negotiations, without any conditions, and without uh, a transition period, and without Ukraine having to fulfill the normal criteria of uh, standards of these trucks and, uh, and the use of pesticides and so on. And the country that is paying the, the most immediate price of pan-European solidarity, uh, which in general, you know, I, I, I support. Uh, and, and the two particular Polish uh, um, professions that, that pay the brunt are, are the farmers and the truckers. And we need to solve this so as not to um, cloud the overall picture of, uh, of, of great Polish solidarity uh, with Ukraine. And, um, and, and there is a uh, solution on the horizon to both of them, which is Ukraine's victory in the Black Sea. Uh, the reason why the trucking, uh, trucking is so vital is that Ukraine wasn't able to export its goods via the sea, and the same for grain. If we really and truly uh, uh, recover the control by Ukraine of uh, Western Black Sea, it will also help to address these issues. The Prime Minister that you mentioned uh, is making a very good argument for dropping it in the area of sanctions. And I'm personally, uh, and my political group, EPP, 
and the Polish delegation in the European Parliament is persuaded that in the area of sanctions it shouldn't be uh, autonomous. So we are discussing about where unanimity makes sense and where perhaps we could drop it. But the um, discussion will be fruitful if we, A, remember the history of this issue, and B, we're creative about it. So let's remember that before Lisbon, we had the Nice system, under which Poland, for example, had only one voice less than France or Germany in the council, one vote less. Okay? We now have double majority. Double majority means that France and Germany acting together can very easily marshal a blocking minority, and it's almost impossible for anybody else to marshal a blocking mi minority. minority. So what's at, what is the subject at hand is where we should um, consider it, and then what does non-unanimity mean? And non-unanimity doesn't have to mean the current double majority. It can mean one member, one vote. It can mean very large countries having uh, three votes, smaller countries, uh, smaller number of votes. Uh, the European Parliament proposed a four-fifths majority, which is non-unanimity. Non we need a fair system that would fairly reflect the wishes of Europeans and would not give anybody an undue advantage. Thanks very much. New thinking needed. Ladies and gentlemen, um, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand. If you would just wait for the microphone, identify yourself, and for preference, questions rather than statements. So over here, Natalie Tocci first, and then a microphone going right over there. I wanted to stick actually with this point um, concerning uh, unanimity, and in particular unanimity within the enlargement process. And I think that you're absolutely right, of course, when it comes to um, accepting a new member in the European Union, this is a treaty change, there's no way about this, right? However, coming back to Tim's point, um, there is nothing in the treaty that obliges us to have unanimity for the opening and closing of every accession negotiation chapter. In fact, it is something that was introduced rather recently, pushed very much by um, France. Uh, so I'm wondering if that procedure basically can be changed and if perhaps France uh, can lead the way in terms of mustering consensus within the, Euro uh, within the Union now to changing that procedure. Thank you very much. Emmanuel, a case for French leadership. Well, uh, you know, I think it's not, on, I mean, all this basically raises very important fundamental questions. And so, I mean, the accession process is not only about um, conditionalities and technicalities. Um, the way the European Council is not only uh, about uh, how you count votes, it's very much about how you basically build kind of a common interest. So indeed, if we have clarity about what we want for our union, we can certainly relax these kind of rules and we can explore you know, better procedures and ways of doing business among ourselves. But then the key point is that you retain the kind of solid consensus that we need among European partners to basically build another Europe, which will be both deeper and um, enlarged. And we'll not be able to do this if we do not agree on the kind of core questions that we have to ask ourselves. And the debate is ongoing, and I cannot say that you know, uh, we are all ready to go to, into the same direction. Brexit already happened. I cannot exclude that another European member of the EU at a point will leave the EU. And so we, we have to work with Europe with different circles, which is an old French idea. And probably the rules to which you refer you know, reflect this idea that we had initially, that you need to have a very integrated Europe and partners around who have a vocation to join but can operate in another context. No, again, uh, before thinking of changing the rules, we have to recreate a kind of uh, 
a, a, a clear sense of direction and make sure that we are able to pull everybody into the same direction. I think this is the right order of questions we have to ask ourselves. Thank you very much. I think we've got so many questions. I'm going to group a few questions and then come back to the panel. So over here, and if we have a microphone for this lady here afterwards. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. My name is Gunter Kriechbaum. I'm spokesman of the Christian Democratic Party in the German Bundestag. Uh, I have a question to Monsieur Bonn, uh, Monsieur, uh, <laughs> to Mr. Sikorsky. Um, we have to observe since a long time that the country, which is already a member in the European Union, is blackmailing almost and always the neighbor countries for bilateral reasons. We had to observe it also in the case of Northern Macedonia last time, and only for bilateral reasons. Could you imagine uh, to find a mechanism in the European Council to qualify a dispute with a majority qualified majority or another sense of majority to qualify this dispute, if it is a bilateral one, then to open the way to an arbitration court, or if it is really a European one. And this question has to be decided with a majority. And if it is really a European one, then it has to be decided on the European level. Otherwise, we will not solve these blockades. And this, I think, could be a path to solve a problem which we have to observe since a very long time. Thank you very much. That's such a pertinent question. I think I'll go straight to you, if I may, Emmanuel, and then Radek to give a quick response. No, I think the question is not only important, but very relevant in the sense that in it, you know, it reflects a reality in the EU today that part of the members or part of partners basically consider the EU as you know, an international organization in which you have certain rights and you are entitled to draw certain benefits from your membership. And so those ones are probably less hesitant to indeed blackmail the others or basically, you know, leverage all the kind of influence they can have through procedures to maximize their bilateral interest, which is not necessarily acceptable in the vision of others like France, who again fundamentally fundamentally believe that the union is a political project. And this is a debate that we need to have. I mean, we will continue to strongly argue that enlargement uh, is to the benefit of a deeper union. But in this context, indeed, we have to explore these kind of rules. And those who are not able to play by those rules probably need to um, work within another context than the one we want for our union, which is, again, um, able to incorporate a better collective interest. Thank you. Radek, did you want to comment briefly on it? The problem is real, uh, but these games are played not only in the context of enlargement. Yeah. They are played in all contexts. And countries use excuses, countries hide behind other countries. You know, you, you know what happens. Um, we do need solutions. I'm not sure your ones would work because people would, would then have pretexts on supposedly European issues. Um, um, we in Poland haven't yet had our internal discussion about what our attitude to the various reform proposals are, but we will, and then I'll be ready for a, for a, a, a discussion with our German allies. Uh, thanks very much. I'm going to take two or three last questions. First of all, this lady here. Thank you uh, very much, Marie, today our correspondent. Uh, the French president is not here, but Emmanuel, you are. So two days ago, he gave a press conference in which he said or talked about uh, regime. He said that uh, Russia has now entered a stage that is more dangerous, more aggressive, harsher. This has been interpreted, and there has been a lot of commentary that this is a departure from the language uh, previously from the president. It may lead to a new doctrine, that this is something new. Uh, can you tell us what the thinking is uh, in Paris, and will this lead to something new, perhaps? If you'd like to hold that for a moment, and we'll take a couple more. There was a gentleman here, if we could have a microphone over there, and then near the back there. Thank you, Michael Gallo from the European Parliament. I'm happy to see former colleagues on the center stage. Um, <laughs> on, on, on the voting mode, uh, I hear interesting discussions uh, from candidate sources who say, well, uh, when I follow these debates uh, on unanimity or qualified majority voting, for my country, 
I need EU membership first and not the, uh, the veto in, on, on foreign affairs issues. So if I had to choose, I would even in the accession treaty subscribe. I'm not using this veto if your argument is we cannot enlarge because uh, there are additional veto comers, so to say. So that my question in this regard, wouldn't that be a way on the one hand uh, to, to allow people, to allow countries who accede to renounce with the accession treaty, to renounce the right for a veto? in specific areas, and those countries, and we have big ones who are in favor of QMV and small ones in favor, and, uh, and the other way around. And all those who are already inside, that they unilaterally say, I renounce this vote, which doesn't make me powerless, because the only thing I have to organize is a qualified minority to get my position through. So right. more creativity is my, my question in this regard. Making use of pastoral clauses, all fine, but I think uh, such discussions that are positive in candidate countries should be taken up and used constructively. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we get a microphone to the gentleman on the aisle there. Uh, Rika Josviak, journalist, Radio Free Europe. Uh, I feel we're skirting around this topic a bit uh, about vetoes, but I, I'd, I'd like to have a clear answer, please, here. Do you need unanimity or not to get rid of the unanimity rule when it comes to opening <laughs> closing chapters and interim chapters. I think we owe our Georgian and Ukrainian friends a clear answer on that. Passerell clauses or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've got five more minutes. We have five speakers. So each speaker now has one minute in which to respond to questions and say anything else I'd like to say. If I could start at the other end, we'll go in reverse order. Well, um, just to answer the question, I think the president, what the president meant is that we have seen a level of Russian aggressivity uh, over two years, which has only increased, and not only against Ukraine, obviously, but against us also very directly. Um, we had a ministerial Weimar meeting recently, uh, and we disclosed with our Polish and German friends, uh, you know, some of the activities, disinformation, cyber activities that Russia is developing directly against, uh, against us in our public opinion, uh, on our, um, in the cyberspace. So this is an element which basically leads us to the conclusion that what we said at the very beginning of the uh, war of aggression, that Ukraine, in a sense, will fight uh, with our support has to be revisited because, you know, the political value of what is happening in Ukraine today uh, has changed in the sense that a lot of the European destiny is incorporated in what is happening today and the effort the Ukrainians are, are, are making. So that's why, basically, in a nutshell, the message of the president was that we have to acknowledge that the Russian threat is also for us, and we have to be up to this fight. And the indictment of the uh, Estonian prime minister by a Russian prosecutor is another evidence of this, and there are probably many other examples I could cite. Thanks very much. Ready? Ready. <clears throat> I don't have a view uh, yet on where unanimity should uh, uh, come in the enlargement process, uh, in, in the negotiations of the enlargement process. But Michael, if you remember, we um, uh, had a view in the discussion on the conference on the future of Europe about how unanimity could work in the area of defense. Um, if we have this rapid reaction force, and we should, it, if memory serves, the idea was that the, a decision to use it in the Council would be taken uh, unanimously, but then the management or the extension of the mission could be done uh, by a, a majority vote. That sounded to me like a sensible compromise. Thanks, Fen. Well, um, <clears throat> when it comes to enlargement unanimity, I think that there are options, for example, to, to, com to combine the votes so that we would not have a daunting task of 140 plus votes of unanimity in front of us, but if they're bundled together, uh, so they're more clear and more important, and I think less uh, uh, fragile. So that means that we would have less, less pressure on them because everybody would be focused on them and very well understood what is, what is going to happen. Secondly, uh, 
the unanimity is being weaponized, and we're seeing that. And you mentioned a couple of cases, but there are additional ones, such as Schengen, against uh, certain uh, countries who would like to join Schengen Zone. They are enabled. And we will, I think that if we will be seeing more and more of that, the frustration alone will push us to adopt certain amendments to, and, and get closer to, uh, to the qualified majority rather than stick to unanimity. We will get there, because if we weaponize it, there will have to be an answer. Thanks very much. Olga. Probably just two messages on my side, as I'm uh, the person who really digged in into the negotiations, and I mean, uh, with all the technicalities. Thank you, France, for the methodology of enlargement. There are a lot of interesting things to 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 see, but probably um, uh, a couple of messages on my side first. Um, in fact, it's uh, Ukraine and the support of the member states to grant Ukraine, Georgia, and Moldova a membership perspective, which basically unpacked the enlargement and made it real. So it has become real not so long ago. And definitely next European Commission, uh, after the elections, whatever the composition of that commission would be, would be the commission of enlargement. And uh, everything which would feed the purpose of making it successful should be done. And um, uh, there's so much focus on unanimity and, uh, and, uh, and the decision-making process. In fact, uh, enlargement procedures should be filtered and uh, uh, should be filtered from the perspective that uh, a number of decisions taken uh, by the member states at different levels should be cut. In. in fact, why would member states decide whether open the negotiations on a specific area or not? if it's a technical process while the political decision has been taken, okay? Uh, why would there be legal obligation to set preconditions for starting something? A legal precon preconditions to start talking to member states to start something. So this is the legal format. It's not possible at all. So Ukraine has to invent another rule of law reforms just to be able to start some to start talking about the possibility to start something you know we cannot reinvent everything we've already uh, we've already done so it should be seriously filtered to feed the purpose and the momentum of enlargement and i feel that basically we're uh, if there any historical period we can compare ourselves is the beginning of 2000s there was a strategic geopolitical decision that Europe will become broader. It wasn't an easy process for Lithuania, for Poland. We know it as well. Thank you for the expertise you share. And, 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 uh, and the procedures should adjust. And uh, uh, basically, uh, it's not about, it's unanimity can help in the decisions where it is needed to have a decision of, at the level of the member states. But, um, but it's not necessarily needed. And probably second very short thing on my side, um, the first thing uh, I heard from my president when um, we were granted the candidate status, uh, we had a follow-up meeting next day, right? And he said, we should use this momentum to accomplish every possible transformation in this country while the war is raging on. Because after the victory, we would have totally different agenda. That what EU is for us. And everything we can do to feed this purpose, to make the reforms in Ukraine happen, will work. And, and, and it is what is merit-based. We are capable to, to deliver, we will deliver, and we hope the system will be able to adjust to that. Thank you very much. President Zorabishvili, you have the last word. Yeah, I'll uh, share that, that it's a momentum for change. What I want to say is that I'm, uh, after listening to you, I'm confident that somewhere you will find the imagination, the creativity to solve the issues that are very real issues of unanimity procedures, what is first and what is last. But what I want to say is that uh, uh, enlargement for us is existential. It's not a question of procedure, a question of liking or not liking. There is no choice. And what I want to share with you is that uh, enlargement for you too is existential today. Because if you take the global picture, 
you see what uh, I think that sometimes we tend to forget that uh, not only Russia has invaded Ukraine and is threatening all of our countries with cyber attacks, uh, with hybrid warfare, uh, but it's now going to anti-satellite warfare, which might threaten communications uh, and the whole logistic of our countries. Uh, so I think that there has to be uh, some fuel into the imagination that is put to solve these issues. We should do more internally, and I'm talking for, for Georgia, to speed up the reforms, but nothing will change the fact that we together have no other alternative but to be together, to be united, to be more democratic, uh, and to stand up to what is today an alliance of autocracies that are fueling terrorism, cyber attacks, every threat is, that is coming is coming from the same direction. So let's look at this picture, which is for Munich, I think, the picture that we need to see so that we do not hide behind some comfort. Thank you for that splendid last word. Three conclusions. First of all, we need a more dynamic, flexible, imaginative and urgent way of doing this. Secondly, the discussion about enlargement is not just about enlargement, it's about the entire future of the EU, what the EU is going to be and wants to be. And thirdly, and this I think is so interesting, it is inseparable from the outcome of the war. I mean, the discussion about Ukrainian grain showed that, and your remarks about the Black Sea, including the Black Sea, so it does come back to the question which has been the dominant theme of this Munich Security Conference. Please join me in thanking our speakers for an excellent discussion. Thank you.